3 million veterans, and we won 5-4 of holy And these threats have only accelerated. You know, a little over a month ago, I was proud to host a religious liberty rally in Iowa. There were 2,500 people come out in defense of religious liberty. It was the single largest political event in Iowa this year. You know, the media diminished threats to religious liberty. They say it's not real. They say it's made up. Don't worry about it. We brought in nine heroes to simply tell their stories. To tell their stories directly from the stage, you know, typically a political event, the candidates front and center. I very deliberately wanted to receive and to have each of those nine heroes tell their stories. There's a reason Jesus spoke in parables. It's what moves hearts, it's what connects with who we are as people. There were people like Dick and Betty Odegaard, a couple I've got to know very well. Dick and Betty live in Grimes, Iowa. They own an historic Lutheran church. They started a business hosting weddings. And wonderful weddings, they did the catering, they did the flowers. And then a couple of years ago, two men came. And they wanted to get married in the Oak Guards Church. Now the Oak Guards are devout men. So they very politely and very respectfully said, listen, we cannot celebrate and host your wedding. It is contrary to our faith. The next day, Dick and Betty were sued. They spent 18 months in litigation. They paid over $5,000 to settle the suit, and they promised never again to host another one. In August, Dick and Betty went bankrupt. They laid off all their employees. This month, they are auctioning off all of the property. Another person who talked at the rally was Kelvin Cotton. An African-American grew up in an inner city, a difficult home. His whole life he wanted to be a fighter. And he achieved his dream and became a fighter. He rose to become the chief of the fire department in Atlanta. He then went to Washington. President Obama appointed him to a national fire board. He moved to Washington, served in the Obama administration. And he came back to Atlanta and resumed his role as chief of the fire department. Well, Chief Cochran was also a Sunday school. And in teaching Sunday school, he began teaching about the book of Genesis. And in particular, he started focusing on the passage where God asked Adam and Eve, who told you you were naked? And he began thinking about what the word naked means, not simply without clothes, but without the covering of God's love, of God's redemption. And he contrasted it to all the places in the scripture where it talks about being clothed in righteousness, clothed in Jesus' redeeming blood. He ended up writing a book based on his Sunday school teachings called Who Told You You Were Naked? And in that book, about a page and a half of that book, discusses human sexuality and what scripture says about it. Chief Cochran was fired for his job for writing that book. In his private time, as a Sunday school teacher, for writing a book about what the Bible teaches, he was told you cannot be the fire chief of the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I gotta tell you, the entire event was three hours, 2,500 people, nobody left. It was, I would encourage you, we have the whole thing online at tedcruz.org, I would encourage you to go watch it. It will lift your spirits to hear these stories. These are ordinary people. A fireman. A florist, a baker, a t-shirt maker. Ordinary people whose faith, faith was tested. Who stood up and stood with God. I believe 2016 is going to be a religious liberty election. For anyone who thinks, well, these are distant threats, these don't impact me. At the Supreme Court's gay marriage oral argument last year, Justice Alito asked the Obama Justice Department, if your position prevails, will the next step be for the Obama IRS to go after Christian universities that follow a biblical teaching of marriage? And by
by extension, Christian grade schools like the school here at Preston, or charities? The answer from the Obama Justice Department is yes. That is a very real possibility, the IRS targeting those who follow a biblical teaching. That is wrong. It is not who we are. But let me give you a word. As these threats grow darker and darker and darker, they are waking people up here in Texas and all across this country. I believe 2016 will be an election like 1980. And it took Jimmy Carter to give us Ronald Reagan. Number one, in 1990, when George Herbert Walker Bush had in one room, 
David Souter, and in another room, Edith Jones, the rock rib conservative on the Fifth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals. And Bush 41, I'm a suit. And then in 2005, George W. Bush had a similar choice, had John Roberts in one room, and had my former boss, Mike Ludig, the rock rib conservative on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, in the other room, and George W. Bush went with Roberts. Now, in both instances, it wasn't that the President Bushes wanted to put a liberal on the court. They didn't want that. But with Edith Jones and Mike Ludig, they had spent over a decade each on the court being a principal jurist following the Constitution. If you nominated them, they would have to fight. If you nominated them, Democrats would go nuts because they'd understand Mike Ludig was Antonin Scalia's first law clerks. They know exactly what they're going to get. And with David Souter and John Roberts, the advantage was they had said very little. They had no paper trail every single time. We've gone with a judicial nominee who doesn't have a paper trail. It's turned into an utter disaster. So in the public appeal, in the Republican field, every one of the candidates will sit down with you and tell you, I will appoint strict constructionists who will follow the Constitution and not legislate from the bench. Those are the talking points every candidate says. The difference is who's willing to actually spend the capital and fight to do what they said. I have spent my entire adult life fighting judicial activism. There are few, if any, choices. Well, one of the things that so many people are upset about is specific people in Washington who don't get things done. Yeah who say one thing and end up doing nothing. And one of the things that we have appreciated about you is your willingness to go and stand on your principles. And even when you are criticized, you are Can you imagine how 
feel different with that. If 11 Republican presidential candidates descended on Washington and spoke in unison and said, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner, don't send $500 million to taxpayers. <laughs>
to this church in 1979. If he had said, Dr. Graham, we're going to cut the top marginal tax rate from 70% to 28%. We're going to go from stagnant economic growth to booming growth, millions lifted into prosperity. Our hostages will be released from Iran the day I'm sworn into office. And within 10 years, we'll win the Cold War and tear the Berlin Wall to break. We would have all dismissed him as a nutcase. <laughs> because under no reasonable assessment of Washington was that possible. What Reagan did in 1980 is he made it a referendum. The Reagan Revolution changed the incentives in Washington. He cut that tax rate from 70 to 28 percent, and he did it with Tip O'Neill, a Democrat, as Speaker of the House. Drove to the airport, bought a plane ticket, 
and flew back to Calgary to be with my mother. So when people ask about the role of faith, I can tell you in my life, if it were not for the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, I, I would have been raised by a single mom without my dad. And, and I'll tell you just a, a, an incredible epilogue. So I, I became a Christian when I was eight at that same church, Clay Road Baptist Church. Gail and Wiley was a pastor who led my dad to the Lord baptized me. And a couple of months ago on the campaign trail, I was in Tennessee. And it so happened that, that Gail and Wiley had, has retired to Tennessee. And he came out to the rally, and, and I had not seen him in 35 years. I was 10 years old when I last saw him. And I have to tell you, it was a powerful, I, I choked up to have the opportunity just to hug Brother Wiley and say thank you. If you hadn't shared the gospel with my dad, my entire life and my family's life would have been there. Thank you. 